So now this problem is a spring problem and a kinematic problem. So let me read it out. So a ball of mass m is compressed at distance x against the Hooke's law spring of constant k with a force modeled by f equals kx. So let me draw this out. Now the first thing we're going to be finding is the velocity of the ball at the top of a loop. So let me draw this out a bit clearer. So we have a wall right here with a spring and a ball compressed against it of mass m. Now the spring is compressed at distance x. And now this is a frictionless surface. And there's a loop right here of radius r. So basically we're trying to find what the velocity at this point is. So the easiest way to do it is through energy, because here we have potential energy, I'm going to write a little u over here, and over here we have kinetic energy because it's moving, and we have gravitational potential energy. So really what we do is we have u is equal to k plus u. Now it's just a matter of modeling these out. But we're not given the potential energy of the spring, we're given the force. But if we remember from our calculus that the force is equal to the negative derivative of d of potential energy. So all this means is we need to take the integral of the force we're given. Now for all those in honors uh, physics that are watching this and haven't taken calculus, I'm going to give you the force once I solve this out, but for AP kids it's important to know how this derivation works. So the integral of kx, right, is going to give us our potential energy. It's so the integral of kx dx, and this is going to be from 0 to x, right, because it's from 0, the point of no compression, to the point of maximum compression. So this solved out, this is just a constant, and this is to a power of 1. So we're going to have k halves x squared from 0 to x, which will just give us that u is equal to 1 half kx squared. So for calculus students, this should make sense. For honor students, we we'll work with this. And then from there, now we can solve to find the velocity, because we know the initial kinetic, we know gravitational, sorry, we know the initial potential, we know gravitational potential, and we know how to find kinetic energy. So now I'm going to erase so we have room to work this problem out. Okay, so initially we have one half kx squared. We're given k and we're given x. So all we're looking for is v. We don't need to find any other substitution in our variables. So one half kx squared plus zero, there's no initial kinetic, is equal to now, there's a tricky part. We have gravitational potential on a radius of r, meaning that our actual height is 2r. So 2r mg, so mgh, and this is our h, plus our kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared. Now I'm going to go variable by variable. We know k, we know x, we know r, we know m, we know g, we know m, but we don't know v. So we need to get everything on this side except for velocity. So the first thing I'm going to do to make my life a bit easier is multiply both sides by 2. So we can get rid of the half on both sides. So we're going to end up with kx squared is equal to 4rmg plus mv squared. Now I'm just going to solve. So we're going to have kx squared equals 4, sorry, minus 4mgr equals little mv squared. So now we're going to divide off the m and take the square root, and we have our velocity at the top of the, uh, top of the loop. So we're going to have k x squared minus 4mgr divided by m, and this positive square root of it is equal to our velocity. So this is the velocity of our ball at the top of the loop on a frictionless surface on a frictionless loop. And then, so the next part is use the velocity calculated, which we have right here, in part A, to find the range of the particle of mass m at the top of the loop. So by that, I mean the loop is cut off here. So the moment it leaves contact with the loop, it fires on a projectile path. So now we're going to be going back to our kinematics. So we know our velocity. So our kinematics involves two things. For me, whenever I do projectile motion, I always think of finding the time of flight, and then using the time of flight to find the range. Because when you think about it, the velocity is constant in the x direction, right? v of x does not change. But v of y is constantly changing. So all that we need to really know is how long it takes for this ball to hit the ground. Once we go from there, it's just a matter of basic kinematics. So we're going to start in the y direction. We're going to start with our y final equals y0 plus v0y t minus 1 half gt squared. This is one of the most important kinematic equations that you know. So first things first, y final, we're hitting the ground. So 0, y initial, 2r, right? Because that's our maximum height plus v0, there's no initial y velocity, so 0, minus 1 half g, 
t squared. And we're trying to find t. So now this is going to take some algebra. So we're going to have 1 half g t squared is equal to 2r, which is going to end up being 4r over g square root equals time. So this is our time of flight. Now, knowing the time of flight makes it easier for us to find the range of the, part, uh, the, range of the projectile. So the next thing we want to do is use um, our components in the x direction. So I'm going to write this over here so we remember our time is the square root of 4r over g. I'm going to erase the rest of it. Okay, so the equations we need to know for the x direction don't involve acceleration because there is no acceleration in the x direction. So we have our final x, which is our range, essentially, equal to our initial x, which we define as 0 at this point, plus our initial velocity, which is constant throughout, times our time. So if this is our variable we're looking for, this is 0, plus our time, which was the square root of 4r over g, times, we found over here, that long equation, which was the square root of kx squared minus 4mgr all over m. So to simplify this equation, I'm just going to combine the two square roots. So our final x, which is equal to our range, I'm going to call that capital R, is equal to the square root of g and m on the bottom, and it's going to be 4r kx squared minus 16r squared mg. So more simplification could be done if we um, take apart the fraction, but this is the answer. I'm not going to make it any more confusing by doing more algebra. On the AP test, as you probably should know, um, you don't need to go into the simplest form for your terms that involve no numbers, because this is technically correct, because your units will work out to give you range. So that's all that matters is that you have this in your final answer. Um, another thing I want to note before the end of this video is that you could do this problem with different forces. Like I said before, one of the most important things that you should learn from this video for future reference is that force is equal to the negative derivative of potential energy. And that's a big deal, because I could give you a restorative force for those AP students, uh, instead of kx, kx squared, or kx cubed, and you'd have to integrate that, and then use it the same way you used 1 half kx squared. It would just be integrating a different restorative force. So just know that these will come up. This idea will come up a lot in AP Physics especially on the AP physics test. So just be aware of that. Um, thank you.